Hey, it's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. We come to you from the beautiful Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrub. Mosquitoes are a serious issue. Not only can they spot you, they can actually detect thermal cues dissipating from your skin. And one of the most important scents that draws mosquitoes in from far away is carbon dioxide, the gas that we exhale when we breathe. And, and Stacy, mosquitoes are not only terribly annoying, they're vectors for disease. They spread diseases like malaria, dengue fever, or West Nile virus. And according to the CDC, West Nile virus is the leading cause of mosquito-borne disease in the continental United States, most commonly spread to people by the bite of an infected mosquito. But the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention just this past week has been talking about malaria, meaning infections, uh, malaria in the U.S., meaning infections were not linked to foreign travel, but appear to have been transmitted by mosquitoes in the U.S. carrying the parasite to four cases, Florida and Texas. Oof, this calls for some serious personal IPM. I got it. You bet. It does. And, uh, you know, we got to pay attention to this. I I was surprised. Each year, around 2,000 cases of malaria are diagnosed in the U.S., but they're usually connected to people who have traveled out of the country. Mm. Today's initial topic, plants, mosquitoes, hate. That's right, Stacey. We're going to talk skeeters today. We may make some comments that may come back to bite us, but uh, we're going to talk mosquitoes and plants that uh, mosquitoes uh, hate. And uh, that's a good thing to identify the plants that mosquitoes hate. And I think a big reason for it, Stacy, is that for many people, they think, well, all mosquitoes are after is our blood, a blood meal. But it's just the female mosquito. Actually, both female and male mosquitoes love plant nectar. Yeah. Something we like to talk about. And so um, taking a close look at plants, probably a good idea if you are plagued by those skeeters. Yes, especially any plant that holds water. You know, like uh, has leaves that hold on to a lot of water. Like I've talked a bunch about my cup plant. Yes. My Silphium perfoliatum, one of my favorite perennials in my garden. Uh, but it does have these unique uh, leaf bases that subtend or surround this is the big square stems. And it makes a cup that holds water. And uh, there's really no way for it to dump out because it's a plant. Uh, and so, yeah, that would not be one to have around if you have a mosquito problem. Now, I have to say, uh, living where I do, and probably you have something similar, very dry soil. I don't, knock on wood, have a huge mosquito issue in my yard between the breezes from the lake and the super sandy soil. Not a huge problem. How about right. you? Well, and same here, being along the beach. And, you know, when people will give you mosquito advice, yeah, they'll say stuff like, uh, well, pick up the old tires that are in your yard that are collecting water. And I'm like, what? Who's got tires in their back? <laughs> a lot of people do, actually. You might be surprised. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think the, the important point here and where I'm trying at least to zero in on is that mosquitoes love plant nectar. As a matter of fact, mosquitoes need plant nectar, especially the males in the whole reproductive cycle and process as far as mosquitoes are concerned. Also, where there are uh, female mosquitoes, you're going to find male mosquitoes and they'll be be buzzing your ears. When folks will spray for mosquitoes, let's say you're going to have a backyard party or something like that. I remember when my daughter uh, got married in the backyard, we used this uh, organic spray, which essentially was essential oils, Mm. lemongrass, cinnamon, that sort of thing. It worked quite well, Uh, but really the focus needed to be on the shrubs and the flowering plants that were surrounding the wet area because again this whole nectar issue if you want an element of control that's where you're going to have some success well and nectar and shelter mosquitoes love to take shelter in cool tall grass 
Uh, that's one of their favorite places to hang out during the day while they're waiting for the night and evening to come back around so they can go out on the prowl. Uh, so, you know, any of that tall kind of vegetation is really where you do need to focus your energy. Now, I think it's important with social media, and we've talked about this now and then on the show, uh, there's a lot of memes yes. or little shareable uh <laughs> things. That's you can get an <laughs> app on your phone that will play a high frequency sound to keep the mosquitoes away from you. Yeah. That's right. a thing? Yeah, it's a thing. Or, you know, people will say like, <laughs> oh, if you just, you know, eat seven bananas and stand on your head, you know, it's right. a surefire way to get rid of mosquitoes. And I think that it's important as with many things online to take all of that with a grain of salt. And I do want to say, we are going to talk about plants that are uh, do sort of have a repellent effect on mosquitoes, but it's so important to understand that no plant is mosquito kryptonite. Exactly. <laughs> you know, if if solving mosquito problems was as simple as planting a certain plant or a combination of plants, then, you know, there would be a lot of people in this world who would be a lot better off because they wouldn't have to be spraying for malaria and all of these things. You know, we're lucky we don't have that problem here in the U.S., but, you know, mosquitoes are a huge problem worldwide. And honestly, if the solution to them was as simple as, like, planting lavender or mint, then you know, we'd be in a lot better place. So unfortunately, no matter what you're seeing on Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest or whatever, it's not quite as simple as just planting something yeah, and no, walking away. I agree. You know, it brings up the point there's a difference between citronella and lemongrass, mm -hmm. for example. Citronella or mosquito plants are actually scented geraniums. It's a pelargon uh, pelargonium. I hope I got that yeah, right. Yeah, you did. Okay, citrosum, and it's marketed as a mosquito plant. But just because you have one sitting next to you doesn't mean that the mosquitoes are not going to bite you. As a matter of fact, with many of these plants, the leaves need to be crushed. We need to uh, have those uh, essential oils, actually uh, the foliage crushed, and create those essential oils to put them to work. And we're talking about plants here mosquitoes hate like lavender, marigolds, mint, lemon balm, peppermint, bee balm, ageratum, basil, catnip, lantana, rosemary, fennel. Uh, there's a variety of plants that mosquitoes don't necessarily care for, but just because you're surrounded by them doesn't mean you're not going to be bit. Right, no harm. They're all beautiful plants, useful plants yeah. that would look great together, but they aren't going to be a substitute for you know an overall mosquito management Pro, uh, program or, or approach in your yard, whether that means, again, emptying out areas where water might stand, whether or not that's old tires or an old <laughs> bird bath or pool cover. I mean, there's a lot of places that when you really look around your yard. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so it, it is, it doesn't hurt. There's no harm in planting these, but you definitely can't treat it as though you've resolved a mosquito problem just yeah. by doing this. Again, go back to the point, though. Mosquitoes love the nectar of flowers. And if you wanted to look at the reverse, some plants that mosquitoes are drawn to because of the nectar, examples would be water lilies, jasmine, a butterfly bush, water hyacinths. Uh, in many cases, uh, they, again, love uh, that aroma. But you're so right that this is a kind of a controversial subject because there's just so much information out there. It's difficult to, to sort it all out. It is. And, you know, a few weeks ago, I talked about sort of one of my surefire ways to find reliable information online. And that is going to a search engine, typing in your search terms, and then yes. the command site, S-I-T-E, colon dot edu. And that's going to limit your results to just university websites. So it kind of helps you cut through the clutter um, and get you to reliable information fast. And by doing that, I can give you one plant that when crushed or extracted absolutely positively does repel mosquitoes. Barberry? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, Calicarpa americana. So our yes. native beauty bush. Beauty, uh, beauty berry? Beauty berry. Beauty, beauty berry. Yes, berry. thank you. Yeah. Not, not beauty bush. Yes, our You're native right. beauty berry, uh, Calicarpa americana, which grows natively throughout the south and southeast. Um, not hardy enough for us here in Michigan. It's pretty much like a zone six, seven plant or pretty much a zone seven plant, but it has big, bold berries. And that has been scientifically proven to have a, an extract in its foliage and fruit 
that will repel mosquitoes. But again, this is not a situation where you can just plant it around your house and say, good enough. Uh, you can make your own mosquito repellent from it. You might find mosquito repellents that are made from the calicarpa plant. Um, but that has been shown again and again. And we actually have a calicarpa in the Proven Winners Color Choice line, per, uh, Pearl Glam beautiful plant. And when I heard about this, uh, I was really excited about it. And then not long after a researcher contacted us and said, Hey, I'd like to test your plant, see if it has this. And unfortunately it didn't. So it seems that only the Calicarpa Americana our true species native beauty berry can do this, but okay. you can, if you have it, it's a fabulous plant and, uh, actually could do a little something for you in, in the mosquito realm. So you have to sort it out, just like uh, just like we're doing. And you're right, that plant uh, on the list. We'll post some stories also on the website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. I found a great story about uh, it suggested that the soap you're using may mm. be attracting uh, mosquitoes. Now that's kind of... Uh, that's kind of interesting. At least the mosquito makes a clean getaway. <laughs> it cannot lie. L-Y-E. If you have I to spell the going. pun, it's I knew no you good. Were, you were going with that. And so, but I don't know if most people would make that connection. Hebrew University in Israel, they're developing a new kind of insect repellent, which is a chemical camouflage. That's interesting. We'll put the story there. And also another study where uh, if you uh, swat at the mosquito, the mosquito has a memory that you've been swatting and avoids you. Really? <laughs> Again, Are you making that up? No, I'm not making it up. <laughs> it's here. It's one of the many things that you can find. So you're just going to walk around perennially like this just to hedge your bets and, you know, hopefully that'll work for you. Don't believe everything <laughs> you read on the internet. Please All right. Don't. There you have it. Coming up next, Plants on Trial, here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's the time of the show where we put a plant on trial, which is to say we're going to tell you all about one of our favorite Proven Winners Color Choice shrubs, and you get to decide if it's going to earn a place in your garden or landscape. And, uh, you know, I didn't have, after all that talk about mosquitoes, uh, I didn't really have a perfect plant to align with a mosquito thing. Now, we, like I said, we do have a Calicarpa Pearl Glam. It's beautiful. It's the same species as the Calicarpa americana that actually does repel mosquitoes, but it is not the same genus. Therefore, it does not, sorry, it's the same genus. It's not the same species. Uh, and so therefore it doesn't have that. So I said, eh, you know what? That's a plant better saved for fall when it's at its best anyway. So what to, what That's to choose? Okay, this plant will be all the buzz. <laughs> it will be, and it's one of my favorites, and it's about to burst into bloom mm -hmm. here in West Michigan. And it is incredible blush hydrangea a beauty it is a beauty now incredible bless you when i say hydrangea it could mean any number of things there's a lot of different hydrangeas out there that are very popular incredible blush is what's known as a smooth hydrangea hydrangea arborescens uh, also known commonly as an annabelle type hydrangea or an annabelle hydrangea now usually we try to kind of avoid that word because annabelle as you may know is a specific variety of hydrangea arborescens been around since the 1960s and this is actually native to North America. In fact, if you travel through the Southeast and the South, you will find it abundantly. I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that I saw one in a Waffle House parking lot once. Oh, wow. Not even planted, like in a planter box, just on the edge where it was surrounded by woods. Love the Waffle House. And, you know, it's so cool when you, this plant that, like, you see in your trial gardens at work and, you know, you see our plant breeders working on and trying to create something really, you know, interesting and new. And you just, like, go out to your car at the Waffle House and there's a wooded edge and there's hydrangea arborescence growing there. It's a, it's a what did you have at the Waffle House? It was breakfast. I don't, you know, not waffles. <laughs> I'm not really a sweets for breakfast kind of person. But, <laughs> but uh, so anyway, this is because it is native. Um, it's it's a very easy to grow hydrangea. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of the confusion surrounding hydrangeas. But this hydrangea blooms on new wood. So you don't have to worry about if, you know, how it survived winter or anything like that. And it's hardy to USDA Zone 3. That is really cold. Now let's talk about that a minute because I think this is important. Uh, winter is often a worry for folks that I run into uh, as it relates to hydrangeas. Oh, yeah. And with this hydrangea, because of how it blooms, winter is not 
a worry. Not an issue whatsoever. Right. Not a problem. Uh, and so anyway, it's been popular since the 1960s when Annabelle came out because Annabelle was the first mop head smooth hydrangea. So the wild types, they have a flat lace cap disc with a lot of pollen. Good for mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Annabelle was a mop head. So what that means is that it has those larger sterile florets. They're showier, but they obscure those nectar bearing fertile florets. And it makes it a lot showier in the eyes of most humans. So Annabelle took the world by storm, but it had a little bit of a liability. It flopped. So you get one of those summer storms, and next thing you know, you come out and your Annabelle hydrangea is just laying on the ground flat. It didn't fail as far as marketing is concerned. It flopped. It fl <laughs> right. The plant yeah, the, physically flopped. The plant physically flops over it. It was hugely <laughs> popular and remains hugely popular to this day, despite its liability of literally flopping over after a heavy rain. And, um, you know, we've always wanted, we had always wanted to find hydrangea arborescence that didn't have this problem. A lot of people don't, it don't mind it, but you know, it can definitely detract and it's sure. always disappointing when you have a hydrangea in full bloom and it's looking fabulous and you get a rainstorm and then the next morning it's just all over the ground. Or if you have to cut the grass and you yeah, know, that's, it's flopped over into the lawn. Yeah, what are you going to do with that? Right. So, uh, we first kind of had our first breakthrough with incredible hydrangea, one of our most popular plants, bestsellers and incredible not only had stronger stems than Annabelle, it also had larger flowers. We crossed it with a variety uh, that we used to offer called White Dome that had very, very sturdy stems. And, you cool. know, through a series of selection, we were able to develop those stronger stems as well as bigger flowers. But as lovely as it was, the flowers are white, they mature to green. Um, and, you know, people who struggle with the more colorful big leaf hydrangeas, the ones that are pink, purple, blue, that kind of color, but can grow Annabelle, we're kind of like, hey, this is this is cool and all, but I wouldn't mind if I got a little color. And we were delighted uh, through working with Dr. Tom Rainey at the North Carolina State University uh, Mountain Horticultural Crops and Research Station that we were able to introduce a pink version of Incredible, and that is Incredible Blush. So everything you love about Annabelle, everything you love about Incredible, but pink flowers. I like that. And the, like the pink it. is really a very unusual pink. When you see it, you know, I think most people think of like a really candy pink, like bubble, Vista Bubblegum Supertunia. Um, this is, I almost call it like a chrome pink or silvery pink because it has these kind of metallic tones to it that's just really, really unique and really, really beautiful. It, it's just kind of a blush. It's kind of like when I get embarrassed by mispronouncing botanical names. I mean, this, this, you get a little blush? A I little couldn't tell blush. under all that tan. <laughs> You're like your summer height tan here. It's summer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is now, it is as great as it is that Incredible Blush is a pink smooth hydrangea, hardy, blooms on new wood, easy to grow. It will not turn blue or purple or white or any other color. It's always going to be pink. This is not the type of hydrangea that despite the fact that we have a pink version is going to change color. So if you get this plant, you're basically going to be have to be happy that it's pink and you should be because it's lovely. That's okay. Be content. Yeah, exactly. Because again, the key here is winter is not a worry. And the fact that it's blooming on new wood you know, when I tell people a uh, panicled hydrangea, or in this case, uh, this arborescence uh, hydrangea blooms on no uh, on new wood, it's almost like they have this sigh of relief, right? Because right. we could prune in late winter or winter, or we could prune in early spring, right? Yep, absolutely, no problem there. We do actually recommend that you do prune smooth hydrangeas like Incredible Blush. We recommend that you cut them back by about a third. Okay. And by doing that, what's going to happen is that you're continuing to build a sturdy, woody base that's going to give it those nice, strong stems. But you're also encouraging a lot of new growth for a lot of flowers. So now, that makes sense because that's a lot like uh, Bud Leah. Also, yeah. the, the new growth tends to be real floriferous. Right. Yes. Yeah. So you want to have some oh, ability to put on the new growth. You don't Good want point. just that old wood. Now, one of the things that people often do with Annabelle that will make it flop even worse is they cut it to the ground. Mm -hmm. And so basically when you do that, you're forcing these plants to reinvent themselves every year. They're oh, a woody plant. They're yeah. a shrub that should have fairly sturdy wood stems. But if you keep hacking them back, 
every year they're coming back with herbaceous stems, not really getting a chance to develop that wood that really keeps those stems nice and upright. That's super important to make note of. I mean, all joking aside, that that's the key to really enjoying these. Yeah, and I, I think and I'm so, sure yeah. you put that in your copy. Right, oh, yes, right? we do. <laughs> if you if you buy an incredible blush, it's in the tag. It's on our websites. We, we do our best to make sure that you understand this. And also some sun. Um, people tend to think of hydrangeas as shade plants. And certainly that's true if you live in a warm climate. They absolutely positively must have shade during the hottest part of the day. But some sun, especially in the morning, is really going to help you not only get the strongest stems, but in a colorful variety like Incredible Blush, it's also going to help you get the best color. In too much shade, that color is going to go kind of muddy, not going to be as clear. And because the stems, as they grow, are going to stretch for the light in a very shaded spot, they're going to be weaker because they're elongated. So good sun, at least four hours of bright sun every day is what we recommend for or incredible blush. Uh, you can even in a cooler climate or if you have irrigation and mulch, you can even take that up to six or more hours of sun each day. Really not a problem. In uh, If you see it in the wild, you're going to see that it's generally growing sort of on the edge of a woods. So it's not deep in the forest where it's completely covered by trees and in deep shade. It's on those edges where it's able to get filtered sunlight, but a little bit of shade and protection from the woods. So I'm going to uh, represent the folks that don't work with hydrangeas every day like you. And that is um, their eyes start to glaze over and they're like all this hydrangea talk. I get confused because new wood, old wood, mm -hmm. uh, all these different types of hydrangeas. How do I figure that out? Well, folks, that's why the Gardening Simplified show is around because in our next segment, we're going to tackle that. We are going to, to tackle it as best we can in 10 yeah, minutes. In 10 minutes. It's definitely a 10 minute plus topic. But, you know, we've always got our show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a little break. We're going to get our bearings. We're going to get ready to give you a whole bunch of information about hydrangeas because it's hydrangea season. It's July. Hydrangea season is here. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified show. Uh, we love answering your garden questions, and if you have one, you can certainly reach out to us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. we got a contact form there, uh, and I haven't had a lot of questions come in on the website yet, but it's July now, and it is the season where the most common garden question starts to be asked in large numbers. And that is, why isn't my hydrangea blooming? And, you know, I, I get it. Like people, hydrangeas are really confusing to people. And I'm going to explain why that is and help you figure this out. Um, but not only are hydrangeas a little bit confusing to people, I don't think that's necessary. So we'll try to demystify them for you, but they're beautiful. And when people plant a hydrangea, they so look forward to seeing those flowers. So it's a huge disappointment when they don't. And, um, it's difficult sometimes to understand why it is as people will go and buy a beautiful hydrangea. And then they're like, well, well, what happens? I planted it. Am I just like not capable of gardening? No, that's not the case. You are absolutely capable of gardening. You just need to have an understanding of what you're dealing with. So we're going to try to break this down for you. The first thing I want everyone to know is that if you bought a hydrangea last year and it was flowering when you bought it in say May, June, something like that, it's not at all unusual that it would not be flowering now. And that's not because it can't flower its first year after it was planted in the ground. It's because it bloomed earlier the year that you bought it. As Rick could certainly tell you, when plants come uh, to the garden center from the grower, they've usually been taken out of a cold area or put into early heat so that they start growing and hopefully start flowering because everyone knows that you like to buy plants in bloom, not something that doesn't have any flowers on it. Well, yeah. And, uh, you know, it causes people to buy impulsively. I yeah. mean, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll admit it. I mean, if it's in bloom and it's beautiful and, and who doesn't want to do that? Walk through a beautiful garden center and be inspired and buy something impulsively. Right. So if you bought your hydrangea last year and it's not flowering yet, don't panic. You were kind of, you weren't misled, but it, it was not blooming at the same time that it's going to bloom now that it's in your yard, now that it's been through winter and under more natural conditions. So don't, don't panic pan about that. That's don't a, panic. that's a nice, easy answer. Are those, are those, those 
panical hydrangea? Panical, yes, oh, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if you tend to panic about hydrangeas, <laughs> panical hydrangeas are for you. Uh, so the next most common reason that a hydrangea doesn't bloom is improper pruning. Mm. And this is where things get a little bit hairy uh, because uh, it's, it is confusing for people. You know, people tend to approach hydrangeas as a monolith. And they think that all of the hydrangeas that they see in their garden centers are growing the same way, are going to be treated the same way. And that's not quite the case. Now, it's not that it's super complicated and you can't learn it, but it's not, like I said, it's not a monolith where you can just kind of, you know, internalize one simple fact and then apply that, reiterate that over all right. of your hydrangeas. Right. So uh, some hydrangeas, and we were talking about Incredible Blush, bloom on new wood. So Incredible Blush, smooth hydrangeas like that, like Annabelle, like Incredible, like the Invincible series, blooms on new wood. And Panicle hydrangeas like Limelight, these are also known as PG hydrangeas, those also bloom on new wood. So what that means is that uh, when they leaf out in spring, they don't have any flower buds on them. They start to create their flower buds as spring develops and those flower buds come out. So it's okay to prune those two types in late winter, in early spring, because there's no flower buds on them. Now, the converse of that is some hydrangeas that bloom on old wood. And these are big leaf hydrangeas. So this is the really popular type with the big pink, blue, purple flowers with the round flower heads, um, oak leaf hydrangeas, which you can see here, kind of blurry in our background, and a climbing hydrangea vine and mountain hydrangeas, which are closely related to the big leaf hydrangeas. Now, these four types all bloom on old wood. That's a term that gets thrown a lot, around a lot without a lot of explanation. But basically what that means is that as soon as they finish blooming or would have bloomed in the summer, they're going to start making their flower buds for next summer. So by the time fall rolls around and they're going dormant, they're actually covered in flower buds. Sure. You can't see them. You don't know they're there, but they, they are actually present on the plant. And, you know, I love hydrangeas, but I swear they try to tempt people into cutting them back because they just look so ghastly in fall. They look like they should be cut back. Correct. This has been my experience, <laughs> and I have found with people is uh, about the time that they start thinking about hanging Christmas lights on the house – and they go out there and they look at the landscape. Maybe they're going to drape some lights in the shrubbery and they see those sticks. Well, let's clean this up. Yeah. Let's chop it back and, you know, step away from the pruning shears and nobody gets hurt. A hundred percent. And, you know, sticks is exactly right. They look like a pile of dead sticks. Right. They aren't dead. <laughs> they have flower buds all over them. You should not cut them back. But they really look like they should be cut back. It's, uh, oak leaf less so. But certainly the big leaf and mountain hydrangeas, they really look like they should be cut back. But if you do cut them back, you are removing the flower buds for the following summer. And that is the number one reason that those type of hydrangeas don't bloom. And I'll tell you, I've heard from so many people who are like, oh, my son was home from college and thought he'd clean up my garden and he cut them back. Or, you know, I hired a landscape company and they just came through here and treated everything the same as another common reason. Or the deer or do the, it for you. The deer, for sure. i had that happen, yes. Deer, uh, all hydrangeas are susceptible to deer damage. Um, some are more beloved than others. Uh, unfortunately, the two that bloom on new wood, panicle, and smooth hydrangeas tend to be the most favored by deer, in my experience. In my, I don't grow big leaf hydrangeas. My garden's too dry, but a lot of people in my neighborhood do, and they don't seem to, knock on wood, bother them all that much. And I do grow oak leaf hydrangeas and those have actually reached a height where the deer can't reach them anymore. So they eat the flowers where they can reach. And beyond that, we're good to go. I have beautiful flowers this year. I love my mountain hydrangeas. Now would tough stuff be considered a mountain yes. hydrangea? Yes. Okay. And I love my mountain hydrangeas. And for two years in a row, I had the deer eat them all the way down to Oof. the ground and they were beautiful plants, but they weren't blooming the way I wanted them to. Generally a very tough hydrangea. When I moved them to the compound and they got compound status and the deer left them, a, wow, did they bloom beautifully. Yeah. So it was just a great example. So that, that. That's like a, a type of pruning, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just pruning right. by deer teeth instead of pruners. Yeah. Um, so that's another reason, but you know, if you've already pruned them last fall or spring and, and that's why it's not blooming, there's unfortunately nothing you can really do about it now. Uh, but you can actually uh, 
know better for next year. So, you know, there's always next year. It's like a gardener's mantra, right? And there's always next year. And so the third reason, and again, this is only going to apply to these old wood blooming hydrangeas that keep their flowers on the plant over winter, uh, is cold damage. Yes. And this is especially true, The cold, obviously, the colder climate you live in, the more likely this is to be the cause of your hydrangea not blooming. But it does even happen to people in milder climates, not because of winter cold, but because of spring frost. Exactly. And so what happens is, you know, spring starts coming along, it's getting a little nice, it's getting a little warm, your plant's like, oh, hey, this is great, I'm going to leaf out. And then blammo, spring, blammo. spring frost... And it just fries that bud because that bud that's on the plant has been left increasingly open by that opening foliage. Um, and this is, a, this is a problem for people even in, you know, like I said, warmer climates. It's cold climates and warm climates equally. Now, the, the fortunate thing is when it comes to protecting them from those spring frosts, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is like throw an old blanket or towel over them just for as long as that frost or freeze threatens. When it's over, you just take it off. They've been protected, you know, just keeping that freezing cold air from contacting that tender foliage and flower bud protects them sufficiently to preserve the bloom. Yeah, here in the north, it's usually a couple of weeks. And what I see happen, Stacy, uh, here in Michigan, I've seen a number of times is the warm up in March, April gets nice and warm, those buds swell. And usually right around Arbor Day, the end of April, we get one of those nights where it's like in the mid 20s for five or six hours overnight. Yep. That's when we do that damage. Exactly. Yeah. So easy to protect against that. Now, if it's dying from the winter, and the way you're going to know if your hydrangea is not blooming because of winter cold is that when it does start to leaf out in, you know, March, April, or whenever that is, you got nothing but sticks. Mm -hmm and you only have like some foliage emerging down at the base, that means your plant died back from winter cold. And your solution there is either going to be to protect it with some sort of structure, you know, like a, a wire filled with old leaves, or like Rick did, move it. Yeah, uh, Move it to a more protected spot. It's certainly worth trying to move it uh, before you just give up on it. Because hydrangeas are one of those plants. You know, most plants that we talk about, pretty easy going. You can pop it in the ground. It's going to do great. Hydrangeas are one that, that need a little bit of consideration yeah. uh, for their sighting. So we are already out of time. I knew this is going to happen. There's just so much to tell. But fortunately, we have the show notes with lots of good information, including a link to our Hydrangeas Demystified info sheet, yeah. which is going to give you everything you need to know to become a hydrangea expert. GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. We're going to take a little break. When we come back, we got branching news. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news, not breaking news, branching news, but we don't make this stuff up, folks. As a matter of fact, I'll start right off the top, Stacy, with a study. We're going to post it at our website, GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com, and that is the top scents that people enjoy the most at home. So there you go. The Favorite scents. And what was number one on the list? Floral scents. Oh. Flowers, potpourri. I like that. I thought That's it was going to be like cinnamon. Nope. Floral scents. Okay. I, yeah, I was thinking uh, chocolate chip cookies. Mm. That's, you know, in the oven. Mm. Floral scents. Citrus scents mm. came in number two. Lemon and orange. Clean and sanitizing scents. Like bleach, chlorine, that sort of thing. I, I mean, I guess. Ba it's clean. Uh, and uh, baked goods. There you go. Okay. Number four. And then wood natural scents like cedar, pine, mm -hmm. fresh cut grass, that sort of thing. The top scents that uh, people enjoy most at home. So I don't know. I guess you can debate it. These people just gave their two cents, so to speak. I'm wondering, okay, so citrus is number two. Mm -hmm. Does that mean citrus flowers or citrus fruit? Good question. And then, so the flowers are in the are in the floral scents, or is it all in the citrus category? I think it's anything that smells like citrus. All right, then probably the flowers in the flower category. It's love, I love the smell of citrus flowers, though. Oh man, that's amazing. It's amazing. Oh yeah, lemon. It's nostalgic, is what it is. All right. On a serious note here, I did want to touch on this in branching news because it's something I've been following all spring. 
Uh, But vineyards and apple orchards across the northeast are still gauging damage from a late season frost in May. So we had a very serious frost in May that wiped out uh, a third or for a number of growers, a, a huge amount of their crop this spring. They're saying the worst frost damage that they have ever seen. Some states are seeking federal disaster declarations Uh, That would make low-interest loans and other programs available to affected growers, while agricultural officials across the region are contemplating together asking the U.S. Department of Agriculture for direct aid to these farmers. So, Stacy, in the the uh, Northeast, things like uh, the vineyards, uh, fruit uh, fruit growers, they really took a hit this spring. Right. Sounds like their hydrangea not blooming is the least of their worries. Exactly. I mean, it was a devastating Oof. frost uh, this spring. So our thoughts are with those folks there in the Northeast. And uh, as they try to recover from uh, that heavy frost, and again, that happened like in mid-May. So everything was totally flushed out. Yeah. And that's when you see serious. We had it. We had a, it got pretty cold for us, it but did. I know in many areas it was really, really bad. Mm-hmm. So. All right, so here we go. It was uh, a few weeks ago that uh, we did our watering show. I just wet my plants, and I went off on a rant about sprinklers and hoses and that sort of thing, and I'm amazed at the amount of um, feedback that I have received, and interestingly enough and overwhelmingly, you felt my pain and Stacy, uh, folks are telling me to get this hose link thing. I looked it up. Did you look it yeah, up? Yeah, I looked it up. That's yeah, an interesting product. It is an interesting product, but it amazed me how how folks just. I mean, to I mean, it was overwhelming. It was Rick Hose Link, Rick Hose Link, <laughs> and you'll fix your uh, fix your problem. So to say thank you, I thought I would write a limb a Rick Ooh. about hoses and sprinklers as opposed to going off on a uh, off on a rant. And one of the things that I thought about doing was, uh, you know, I'm going to try and create a limerick using artificial intelligence. Ooh, it's, our AI is good at rhyming. It crashed and burned. I thought it was totally lame. Here's what it came up with. There once was a sprinkler so bold, its water sprayed freely untold. With a rhythmic spray, it made flowers sway and turned summer's heat into gold. Yeah, it's nice, but it's kind of like something you'd find on a Hallmark card, right? Uh, uh, all told, or that that was a little bit of a questionable word choice, I yeah, think. Yeah, exactly. So I decided to create my own Lim Arik because my name is in Lim Arik, if you haven't caught that already. So here we go. Here's my Lim Arik as a thank you for all those hose link people out there who are going to cause me to buy a hose link contraption. One of my sprinklers is oscillation. The other is supposed to be pulsation. But nothing they're wetting, just stuck on one setting, resulting in my frustration. Oh. My hose is kinked, it's just dripping. And my patience, well, it's just flipping. I'll buy anything. I'll give it a fling. Just send it my way, I'll pay the shipping. (laughs) So thanks for understanding my ordeal. I'll be buying a new hose reel. You could say I'm skeptical to buy another receptacle, irrigation's my Achilles heel. So there's my limerick for all the advice that I, folks gave me. I love it. You know, anything that makes watering easier, whatever your least favorite garden chore is, anything that makes it easier is worth investing in. Well, I think they understood just intuitively from watching and listening to the show that, for example, at home, if there's a plumbing project to be done and I engage in it, it's generally a disaster. Oh, It includes 20 trips back and forth to the home improvement sh- uh, store, and uh, it's still leaking after that. So there you have it. There's a reason why plumbers are paid so That's well. right. Exactly. <laughs> they got skills. And I'm more than happy to pay them to, uh, to do the work. Police officers utilized a YouTube app on their phones to play a series of mother duck calls to lure ducklings that had fallen through a storm grate into the opening. Now, this was in New York. I believe it was on Long Island. Uh, And uh, 
So all four ducklings responded to the sounds and waddled their way to safety and back to mom. So what a cool thing. These police officers utilized a YouTube app to get these four ducklings that have fallen to their peril in, uh, through the storm grate. Uh, to get them to waddle their way back to safety and mom. Now, that is cool. I love it. I also love imagining this conversation of the police officers yes. standing around going, what are we going to do? Oh, I know. <laughs> Let's try a YouTube video. <laughs> and then they're uh, holding it. That's so cute. They all took it in stride. They said, put it on my bill. You know, <laughs> there was a quack in the sidewalk. Actually, they asked these uh, ducklings to show their proper documents. I'll stop now. Nah, maybe they'll create a documentary about this. Okay. I'd watch it. <laughs> I would too. Uh, serious note here to end up branching news this week. And I want to ask you this question, Stacy. Uh, we'll post the story at gardening simplified on air.com. But uh, why is grass the only acceptable planting material in the right of way? Now, the right of way, of course, is that area between a homeowner's sidewalk and the street curb. You will see some people uh, getting pretty creative. And then, of course, yeah, you run the risk that they're going to dig it up. Yep. Uh, and so you plant grass. But uh, in Canada, a lot of talk about this. I found an interesting story on it. We'll post the story at gardening simplified on air.com. But I mean, is there something better than grass to put in that right away in, in your opinion? Or? Oh, yes. <laughs> Lots of things. I mean, I think a lot of people who are gardeners uh, probably get their gardens in their yard all set and then they start eyeballing that yeah, right exactly. away or the easement. I, I always call it the easement. They're like, hey, you know, there's a <laughs> lot more planting space over there. Look kind of cool. Um, yeah, so I actually just this morning, in fact, was talking to my husband about planting some sedum. We just had some construction oh, there done. You go. They replaced our water supply line and it's all torn up and I didn't want to start grass because it's the middle of summer and, you know, uh, and so I thought about planting some like ground covering sedums in there. It's not a bad idea. See, my problem is come March, April, I always have snowplow disease mm. out there. Yeah. You know, it a lot gets of icy, yucky, just crusty gets torn snow. Up. Yeah. You know, just torn up by the snowplow. Well, if it's a ground cover sedum, you got nothing to worry about. <laughs> the snowplows, the shovels do not uh, impact that whatsoever. Finally, on today for uh, branching news, just want to mention last week we got a chance to. Uh, talk to Adriana Robinson. And, uh, you know, I was thinking what would be loads of fun is if you can be sending us some pictures yes. also. Okay. We want your questions at gardening simplified on air.com, but boy, send us some stuff too, like stories or thoughts or, and thank you to those of you who have, uh, but also pictures. Cause I want to see your gardens or maybe your public right of way. Show me. <laughs> what I should be planting aside from this. right, it's the height of the garden season, and we would absolutely love to see what you're proud of and what you've got going. Uh, and we can share the same, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Adriana, our producer and engineer of the Gardening Simplified Show. And most of all, thanks to you for tuning us in on YouTube, listening to the podcast, listening to us on radio, share it with friends and neighbors. Have yourself a great week.